Wait, right? Yes. Yeah, we did dream of the rig. Sorry about three hours of sleep last night. Um, and we're supposed to take, if I can find it, four days for Beowulf, which if we do, I'll be very surprised. Yeah, more than likely. Um, I don't have the syllabus in front of me. I don't remember when. It's on the 15th? Yeah, it's on the 15th. I can guarantee, almost guarantee you that. Um, I don't think I've put it up yet or posted it yet, but I will be posting a couple of documents to the website, uh, to D2L, that might be, did I hear somebody say, yeah, did I already? Okay. Um, that might be helpful. One of them is a guide to characters um, and the feud element in Beowulf. Yeah, and another one looks like this. Hopefully it printed out correctly. A uh, guide to the characters and feuds in Beowulf. Genealogy, which you do have. Hold on just a second. I believe at the end of... Yeah, you kind of have one. You, actually, you got... Pretty much the whole thing, okay? Um, in the back of Beowulf in your butt. So what Liuza is giving you is essentially this information first, okay? And then this comes after. Um, I've been doing this a lot longer than it's been available in the textbook, though. Um, I'm not, I don't want to talk about this introduction. I am going to do a kind of introductory background, which is how we're going to get off um, or get behind pretty quickly. So Beowulf, title, as we talked about the other day with both the Wanderer, Seafarer, Dream of the Root, title is not in the manuscript. There is no title in the, in the manuscript, per se, for this poem. It just begins. You turn a page, and it looks literally like that. And I can, you know, maybe, a, I won't do it today, but maybe I'll do it another day, um, pull up images, because the entire manuscript images are available online, right? Um, and pull it up because you can see just by looking at this page, you know, this margin looks fine. This outside edge looks totally fine, or what appears to be an outside edge. This edge, however, is kind of ragged and fragmentary. That's because of the fire that the manuscript suffered in 1731, right? This is the outside edge of it, and this part burned. You were to put this book in a fire, that mean you put this book in a big fire, big old bonfire, like a fire the size of this room. You could throw this book in the middle of that fire, and guess what? This here is not going to burn. Why? Simple basics. Simple basic law of physics. There's more area to burn on the end. Okay. Could be that there's more area to burn. The first syllable of that word area, however, air. There's no air here. Fire needs oxygen to burn. Okay? There's no air there. So, the manuscript is damaged. Okay? Now, when Beowulf was composed, we don't know. So, it's date of composition. Is one of the huge questions about this poem. When was it originally composed? And how was it originally composed? So, when... 
and how. Okay? The range of possible dates for when. Um, anywhere from the 7th century up to the very early 11th century. Okay, So when is that? Not many people would go this early today. But that's 600 to early 11th century? 1025. It would be the kind of latest date most people would say would even be within the realm of possibility. Okay? Most would say, if you're going to talk about the early, earlier, somewhere more like earliest 700. Okay? So roughly 300 year period, 700 to 1025. That's the win. All right? How? Two ways. It's either literate or it's oral. Literate, it's written, composed. Okay? So whoever the author was knew how to write and knew how to read, more importantly. Because if it's literate, it's probably an indication that the author was familiar with other written works of literature. Okay? which are possibly alluded to within the poem, right? If it's oral, that means that somebody, somewhere in the mists of time, sat down one morning and, you know, like Tolkien writing The Hobbit, you know, turns a page and suddenly this idea pops into his mind. This guy named Beowulf, yeah, yeah. And he arrives and he kills a monster named Grindel, yeah. And then his mother and then the dragon. <coughs> And he kind of builds it all over time, possibly. It's a huge oversimplification. We know oral formulaic, what's called oral formulaic poetry, how oral formulaic poets create, right? There are, you can go to the Harvard, um, the Houghton Library at Harvard University, and you can check out tape recordings done in the 1930s, okay? Um, by a couple of Oxford scholar, uh, Harvard scholars of Yugoslavian bards. Okay, they'd gone over to Yugoslavia and they recorded these singers of tales who, who would sing tales 30,000 lines long. In each performance, because they have multiple recordings, each performance would be a little bit different. Because each one was a performance. It wasn't merely that these bards memorized these songs and then <coughs> replayed them perfectly. If you saw the Hamlet production um, last week, if you went on two different nights, you would see two different performances. Because no actors do the same thing again and again and again and again especially when they're doing one play, multiple performances, sometimes twice a day, etc. They, you know, they'll accentuate slightly different things. Their pronunciation of certain words will vary, etc. If they're really good, they'll play off the audience and audience involvement and interaction. If the audience is dead, okay, sometimes they'll go a little over the top to try to bring the audience into it. To wake them up, etc. Okay? So, literate or oral, early or late. So, you can, another way of looking at this is early composition or late composition. Okay? Here's the wrinkle how you understand or when you understand Beowulf as being composed greatly affects how you understand the poem. That is, if the poem was originally composed early, sometime, let's say 700, then it means something a at least 
a little bit different than it does if it dates from, say, 1000 AD. Okay? And here's why. If it's from roughly 700, then it is talking about events that, whether they are fictional or real, okay, would have occurred less than or fewer than 200 years previous. There is an actual historical detail within the poem, an actual historical event that we know the date of. Helak, Beowulf's uncle, dies. He died in 520 AD. He was real. He was real. Beowulf, probably not so much. Okay? So 520 AD, 700, less than 200 years. If the poem dates from more like 1000 AD, then it puts Helak's dateable death in the Events of the poem, again, whether fictional or real, how much farther back in the midst of time? Well, an additional 300 years. What, what tends to happen to events, historically, as you get farther and farther and farther away from those events? They get more fictionalized. They become more fictionalized, they become distorted, okay? What else? The poem is written in Old English, or Anglo-Saxon, okay? And yet it's celebrating whom? A Danish a, person. A Danish leader, leader, warrior, okay? And, well, take that back. It's celebrating some Danish leaders. Beowulf isn't a Dane. Beowulf is what is called a geet. And you'll hear this pronounced... Three different ways. Geet, yat, or gat. Okay? Just go with the easy one. Geet. Okay? Hrothgar and his crew, they're the Danes. All right? And yet it's written in Old English about Danes in geets. Okay? There should be a map. I think I uploaded a map to the T2L website. If I didn't, I will. Okay. Geats were in southern Sweden, right? So, from an Anglo-Saxon perspective of, of, oh, I don't know, sometime after 793 AD, anybody tell me what happened then? What began? It's the first year Viking longboats were seen. It's Written in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it's actually written down for the year 787, but it's wrong. Okay? We know it was 793. In 793, there is this little short enigmatic entry. It's, it's the only entry for the year. In this year, or on this year, three long boats were seen. That's it. It's, it's kind of this ominous, prophetic, you know, uh-oh, it's about to hit the fan. Okay? And the Viking invasions begin shortly thereafter. All right? And they go on for quite a while. That's 793. Alfred becomes king in 871. Vikings are still marauding the land. He defeats Guthrum the Dane in 878. He buys himself and his people about 12 years of peace. And then the Vikings get at it again. They're doing their raids, essentially. Off and on, I mean, there are some dry years where there aren't rape, but there are other where there are up until almost this year. In fact, a Viking becomes king of England in 1016, as we talked about. Canute the Great, okay? So you have Anglo-Saxons, or an Anglo-Saxon, using the Anglo-Saxon language, writing a big, long poem, celebrating or writing about Danes and Geats, who according to the Anglo-Saxons would be called what? What term did they use to call the Vikings? They didn't call them Vikings necessarily. Sometimes they do. They call them heathens. <laughs> Those damned heathens, you know. Why? Because they're pagans, they're not Christians. 
So if the poem's early, what does that mean? That means somebody composes this poem, maybe here, well, notice what hasn't begun to happen. In 700, 725, 750, all the way up to 775. The Vikings haven't begun raiding. Okay. Where did the Old English, the Anglo-Saxons, come from? The Angles, the Saxons, the Jews. Came from where, Bede tells us. They came from northern Germany, the area of the Angles, the Saxons. You still have Saxony in Germany today, okay, and the Jews. Well, what generally is that area? Northern Germany and Denmark. So, 700, it could be what? It could be somebody composing a poem about one's ancestors, one's tribe, one's, you know, family group, even though they might be, let's say, distant. Okay? It'd be like, you know, a Native American today writing a story about the glory days of Native Americans 500 years ago. Okay? Only in this case, it's 200 years ago. And if it's somebody doing this in 700, what might they be privy to? Oral history. I mean, stories being passed down, father to son, mother to daughter, etc., that this person then weaves into this poem. If it's... Um, okay, so let's assume that it happens. Well, then... What kind of audience would the poem have after the Vikings start raiding? Okay, it's written in Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxons are, are listening to it. If it's being recited, if it's being orally performed at all. Would it be antagonistic? Yeah, I mean, one famous Beowulf slash old English scholar said, you know, think about this for a moment. <coughs> You're Telling this poem, this story, that celebrates the ancestry of the people who are marauding your land, who are raping your women, stealing your cattle and gold and silver, burning your churches, and burning your crops to the ground. You really want to be telling that kind of story publicly? Probably not. Okay. So there's a there's a possible problem. It's thought, okay, for that early date in terms of the transmission of the poem. The poem being passed on from roughly 700 until about 1000 AD when it is written in the single manuscript we have that preserves it. There's no other written source at all for this story or any variant of this story. It's the only one we have, okay? 1000 AD, however, oh, back up for a moment. This would also explain, the early date would also explain, some argue, for why there are no overt <coughs> Christian references. I mean, Anglo-Saxon England's only been Christian for 100 years. In 700 AD. Okay, we talked the other day about how possibly, you know, the dream of the rood was written to do what? To help reinforce doctrine. Maybe for some Germanic folks or of Germanic heritage who were having some difficulty with this whole dying God, you know, protector, savior kind of a thing. So it gets portrayed as a warrior and such. So that's another argument possibly for the early days. You go to this late date, well, Anglo-Saxon England's totally Christian by this point, okay? But you still have the problem in 1000 AD of Vikings. You know, and if you move up to 1014, 1016, you've got the very real problem of Svein, Forkbeard, of Norway invading England, dying, and then his son, 
continuing, and becoming sworn in as king in 1016. So now you have a oh, heathen on the throne. So if you if you really want to you know step in a great big gooey pile of you know what argue vociferously really strongly on you know ANSAX, which is this international list for Anglo-Saxon scholars I don't want to be just choose one and go at it because you're going to get people from one side or the other who are going to blast you all right so it's a I mean it's a really thorny Topic and people have come up with all kinds of arguments for the early date, before the late date, or against the early date, or against the late date. Problem is, we don't have any conclusive proof. We have internal evidence, linguistic evidence, that is, evidence of the language itself within the poem, but there's problems with that because it, the poem's not written in a single Old English dialect. There were four major Old English dialects. It's got elements of all of them. So it kind of sounds like somebody had it in, say, London, and then it gets taken up to like, York, and it gets copied there in a kind of a Northumbrian dialect, and then it gets taken west, and it gets copied in a Mercian dialect, and then it gets taken south, and it gets copied in a late West Saxon dialect. So it's got elements of all of them. It'd be like, you know, Something being written in Iowa, and then it gets taken down to southern Georgia, and you get some <coughs> southern Georgia isms in it, and then it goes up to Tidewater, Virginia, and you get some oi kind of sounds thrown in there, and then it goes up to Harvard, and you get pot the ka kind of in it, and it goes way out west to nothing. I mean, because pretty much you go west of the Rockies, and they all sound the same. Until you get really north in Washington, and you start hearing people say A all the time, because you're north close to Canada, and then it goes down to Southern California, and it gets mixed in with some Spanglish. That's what it would be like. Okay? Christian. So like, potentially, like, this manuscript is probably re-edited to fit different narratives or different... Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say it's re-edited. We don't know that. We do know the manuscript is written... Excuse me. Beowulf is written in what's called two hands. That is, two different people copied the poem that we have in the manuscript. Okay? They're referred to, great unique names here, Scribe A and Scribe B. Okay? Scribe A was happily copying on along until he gets to line 1939. Pretty sure. 1936, but I'm pretty sure it's 1939. And it just stops in the middle of the line. Okay? And the poem isn't written in lines like you see here. It's written in lines like you see here. It's just straight on across. No cesura, no indication of quote unquote rhyme, no indication of meter. Okay, it's just like a journal, all right? And it's like, you come across here, say this is line 1939, and it literally stops in the middle of the line. Scribe A's handwriting. Scribe B picks up, and it's clear as night and day, okay? Because Scribe B apparently has a thicker nib, whereas Scribe A is writing like this, uh, when in course of and scribe B's writing like this. Notice the difference. Fat ink, thin ink, etc. Different letter forms. So that it looks like scribe B was taught how to write, maybe in a different what's called scriptorium. Okay? Monastery house that produced written documents than Scribe A was, okay? Here's the kicker. Scribe B then goes back through the first half of the manuscript, lines 1 through 1939, and makes corrections. 
<laughs> of what Scribe A did. I mean, there are words crossed out. There are words written in over other words. Okay? There are words added <coughs> where apparently the first scribe left a blank. Like he... What this is indicating is that scribe B probably had what's called an exemplar, something in front of him he was copying from. That he could go back and say, oh, you moron, you... and messed up this other part. Okay? So, yes, Amelia. Could it also be that, like, scribe A, I mean, this is maybe a stretch, but scribe A maybe, like, taught himself or herself or whoever wrote it how to write, and then scribe B had more education than scribe A? Um, I mean, that's probably a stretch, but... Yeah, that would be highly unlikely that you would have anybody, quote-unquote, self-taught. I mean, writing was, in 1000 A.D., very, very few people could read and write. Pretty much only people who could would be monks, clergy, some royalty, okay? Alfred could read and write, for example. Um, we get in the life of Alfred a story about how he learned to read and write. He did it so that he could win a book that his mother had. He cheated at that point. He was 12. He memorized a poem on a page. He couldn't read it. But he said, oh, it turned to this one. And then acted like he memorized it. Which, you know, a five-year-old can do with Good Night Moon. You read the thing over and over and over, they know which words go with which images. They can't read the words necessarily, but they can, you know, go through. And that's what he did at about, uh, at about the age of 12. Okay? And, and I'm oversimplifying a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. There, there's an, an awful lot more going on, and I'll talk about some of it as we uh, go on. One scholar, a guy named Kevin Kiernan, argued in 1980 for the first time, and has since done it in a book, and, and still maintains this. A lot of people think he's utterly crazy. Um, that the poem that we have is ultimately the only Beowulf poem like this that ever existed. Okay, now, what do I mean by that? Kiernan argues that the poem that we have in the manuscript that we have it is written by the author of the poem. Okay? That prior to the poem as it exists in this manuscript, this poem never existed. There might have been poems about Beowulf fighting Grigal. And maybe another poem about Beowulf fighting Grigal's mother. And maybe another poem about Beowulf and his fight with the dragon. But there had not been, prior to this, a poem that covered all three of those events. Same as a drag? No but like a single individual story. Think of the Marvel Universe. The Marvel Universe is ultimately telling what? One big story. What's part of that story? Thor, Iron Man, Captain America, okay? Or don't think of the whole Marvel Universe. Think of just, you know, the Avengers. Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, you put them all together, and you end up with the Avengers movie kind of thing. That kind of thing. In other words, that they were these individual stories. Now, Kiernan is, when he argues that, he's going back to an idea from the late 1800s called the Liederterry. German word means... Lays or songs theory. And that theory was that Beowulf is actually, the, the Beowulf we have is a compilation of a whole bunch of songs. Okay? Not just two or three. And we'll talk about some of these songs as we go through the poem. For example, there is what's called the Finsburg episode where after Beowulf kills 
one of the monsters, a poet comes into the hall and says, meanwhile, and he sings a story about this other Germanic episode. Well, that's an individual play or song. That, according to the scholar who came up with this theory, gets all mixed together into this one big long mishmash known as Beowulf. Right? He actually argued that Beowulf is composed of over 20 individual little songs. <coughs> Just kind of get plugged in. Okay? Because a lot of people read this and they say, first of all, this author doesn't know how to focus. He doesn't have a narrative arc that he just follows. It's like, okay, here's Beowulf. Oh, look, a bunny. And he goes chasing down the bunny trail. Okay, They're called digressions. The, narr the editor, Liuza, in the introduction, talks about the digressions and episodes. These are all things that some readers say detract from the main idea. So what's the main idea? What's the main idea of this big, long poem? How many of you read this in high school? Or let me rephrase it. How many of you read a version of this in high school? I say a version because it really depends on what you read. You might have read Seamus Haney's translation, like in AP English in the last few years, okay? It's not bad. It's not good. Uh, as Anglo-Saxon scholars, when it came out, not so affectionately referred to it as Haney Wolf, because it's not Beowulf. It's more Seamus Haney than it is Bale, but it will include the wolf part. And that's because he, he takes some pretty free liberties with the poem, okay? I mean, who might have knocked Seamus Haney, you know, Nobel Prize winner for literature, so. Um, what else? Um, well, there's Burton Raffles translation that used to be used in AP English classes, which isn't worth toilet paper. I mean, it is, it's, it's not a trans, it's an, a loose, free adaptation, right? And it's about almost as far from Beowulf as some of the stuff, well, any of the movies you've seen of Beowulf. There, I mean, they're, they're worse than, Peter, than what Peter Jackson does to Lord of the Rings. They're, they're really, really bad, <laughs> which doesn't make sense because this poem Whoever composed it had a cinematic eye. This poem should not take much to really be converted into film and should be a blockbuster. None of those have been blockbusters. Why? Have any of you seen any of the Beowulf films? Yeah. Okay. Gerard Butler, when the Gerard Butler one came out, I thought, this is going to be great because the trailer was, you know, first of all, Gerard Butler as Beowulf. Excellently chosen, okay? But he starts reciting, he starts saying his words, and it's in his rich Scottish brogue, which Old English would sound an awful lot like Scottish, okay? So really good. The one with, um, is that the one with Skarsgård? Well, yeah, there's the stupid Angelina Jolie. Cat woman tail thing. There was a really bad one. They're, they're all really bad. The, the Christopher Lambert, that one, yeah. which is like 23rd century techno Beowulf. But what all those do is they introduce all this Freudian nonsense. Okay? Where Grendel is the offspring of Hrothgar and Grendel's mother. Nothing. Absolutely nothing in the poem suggests that. I mean, there's there's not a single syllable that even gives an echo of that. And yet, that's what filmmakers want to do. Why sex sells, you know? Especially if it's Angelina Jolie with a tail, I guess. <laughs> Which is just really weird. Um, and, you know, and I've got problems with that because Ray Winston played, you know, Mr. Beaver in the Chronicles of Narnia. So how do you get Mr. Beaver to be, you know, Beowulf? It's, the voice just doesn't work. So, okay, so how does the poem open? 
it begins, I brought in an old English version. It begins, you've got the opening page. What? There's that thing to get people's attention. It's, Shut up. I'm getting ready to recite this poem now. Listen to me. Okay? Which the user translates here, listen. Okay? Could be listen. It could be what? What? Weg ardena in yardagum, theod kininga, frim ya frunan, who is the atherlingus, Ellen Fremadon. So, we have heard of the glory in bygone days of the folk kings of the spear days, how those noble deeds did loft, how those noble lords did lofty deeds, or noble deeds did lofty lords. And let's bring in the Freudian stuff. Um, okay, so. We get in Yardagum, which Luzer translates as in bygone days. But what is it literally? I mean, listen to that again. In, drop the in part. Yardagum. Yar, your, dagum. Day, days of your. It's literally what it is. So why does he use instead in bygone days? Does days of yore sound too archaic? Sound too uh, elementary schooly? Too fairy tale y? How, how many of you used bygone in the last 10 years? Yeah, that's what I thought. Nobody uses that. Sure, nobody uses days of yore either. So what's the poet getting at? This what you're listening to someone who's been gone for a long time. We're talking a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> it has the classic what kind of beginning? Once upon a time. The poet is telling us this is a fairy tale. Okay? without telling us this is a fairy tale. He's using the traditional fairy tale beginning, essentially. Okay? So what's he saying happened long ago? We've heard of the glory in bygone days of the folk kings of the spear days, how those noble lords did lofty deeds. Okay? Did, heard, long ago, Where's the time emphasis? It's not now. Okay? It's a long time ago. So whether we're talking 700 AD or 1000 AD, for a lot of people, 200 years ago is a long time ago. 500 years ago, that's a long timer ago. Okay? <laughs> Often, shield shoving seized the mead benches from many tribes. Troops of enemies struck fear into earls. Oft shield shaving, shaven a thratum, monigum mythum meruset la oftea, ersoda erlas, seven erst worth fashat funden. Okay? Oft, often. It can mean often. It can also mean, as we saw with a couple of other poems, always. Okay? Shield shaving did what? Shev the ing at the end of shev means son of, okay? Or, can be more broadly construed, descendant of. And a lot of early scholars said, oh, shield, well that's shield. Son of sheaf. We're talking about a vegetation or fertility god, somehow, okay? No, not necessarily. We're talking about somebody named Shield, son of sheaf. Seize the mead benches from many tribes. What does that mean, he seized the mead benches? Does that mean he ran into their hall, kicked them out, took their chairs? Because that's what it sounds like. Okay, he took their homes? Took their halls? So what happened to them? They died. He destroyed them. To say he seized the mead benches from many tribes, it just sounds like, you know, 
It's weird. <laughs> he didn't only seize their mead benches. He killed them. He seized their halls and their lands. So put shield shoving in a modern 21st century context. What word would we use to describe him? Starts with a T, has ist at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. He struck fear into earls. Though he first was found, I don't know why he uses waif, but waif. What's a waif? A young, thin, attractive woman. Okay. <laughs> so Shield Sheving was first found, a young, thin, attractive woman. He was trans. No, but that is the typical meaning of waif. Isn't it like a scavenger kind of? Like a... It's just something to start with. Yeah, okay, but not. So maybe because it's just really young and. Young. A better word is a foundling oh. or orphan. Okay, he was an orphan. Yeah, the etymology says I'm from the prophet who was stray animal, kind of like something that's just not elegantly. So, though he first was found awake, he awaited solace for that. The word that gets translated solace is frovra. It's not used anymore in English. It completely dies out. Okay? But it's used several times throughout the poem. When you get a word other than, you know, like a pronoun or an article of something or something like that. But when you get a word that is used repeatedly in something, that kind of tends to imply the poet wants to emphasize the idea behind the word. So, solace is one way it's translated. Consolation is another. So, though he first was found awake or foundly or orphan, he awaited solace for that. He grew under heaven and prospered in honor until every one of the encircling nations over the whale's writing. Here's another one of those words. It's the old English is a kidding, but he doesn't translate it as to what it actually <coughs> suggests or means. What's the whale's writing? The ocean. So that until every one of the encircling nations over the ocean had to obey him, grant him tribute. Now, if we were looking at a map... You know, you'd have Norway sticking out over here, and then Sweden comes out over here, Denmark kind of comes out, and you've got some islands over here. The Geats are down here. Shield Chevy, where he is, is on this island between Denmark and the land of the Geats. So when it says all the neighboring tribes across the ocean, it's talking about all these people and all these people and possibly so this is a, quite a bit distance away. These people. He rules this area. All right? They did what? They had to obey him, grant him tribute. This guy is so fearsome that all the neighboring kings do what? Pay him tribute. What's a modern word for tribute? Mm, no. Good guess. The different well, I, my the right wing part of me is going. You know, the more I think about that, <laughs> ransom. You pay somebody off. It's protection. It's protection money. It's what you pay the mafia so they don't bust your building up or you. You know. And then we get this phrase. Fat was God killing. Fat was God killing. Okay. Which Luisa translates, that was a good king. <laughs> Exclamation mark. So, what makes a good king? Conquering. Louder? Conquering? 
subjugating others, scaring the hell out of others, terrorizing others. Okay, protection racket. That's a good king. Is that a good king? No. Modern terminology, modern mindset, no, that's not nice. Can't he just get along? No, he can't. <laughs> Why? He's a pagan Germanic king. So what's the mark of a pagan Germanic king? If we take Shilcheving as an example, what did he do to his neighbors? Killed them. Right? He took their homes, he took their territory. In taking their homes and their territory, what does he do for his people? He expands their land. It's also a way of protecting your people, right? If you remove your people's enemies, then they don't have what? Enemies. Thank you. <laughs> then they don't have any enemies. Except for those who are farther away. And if you make those farther away afraid of you by killing those nearer you, you're more likely to keep them what? Away. Farther away. Okay? A boy was later born to him, young in the courts, whom God sent, there's that word again, as a solace to the people, or as a frovre. It's the same word for the people. Okay? Whom God sent as a solace to the people. He saw their need. Who's the he? Is it no. this young son that God sent? Or is it God? Because in the Old English manuscript, guess what? It's not capitalized. Because they didn't capitalize pronouns for divinity. That's a relatively recent innovation. Right? So, he saw their need, the dire distress they had endured, Lordless for such a long time. The Lord of life, wielder of glory, gave him worldly honor. Seems to me that he is talking about God. God saw the people's need. He saw what? The dire distress they had endured. When? Lordless. Well, when were they lordless? Before Shield Shevin came? Well, they were because he came as a child, or is this after Shield Shevin dies and the child grows up? Well, we don't get any indication of that. All we get the indication is afterward a son was born to him, young in the courts. God sent the son as a solace. Okay? The Lord of life, the wielder of glory, gave him, the son, worldly honor. What's his, the son's name? Beowulf. The son of shield. And then loser gives you a footnote. Not the monster slaying hero of the title. Okay. But an early Danish king. Many are uh, many argues scholar. Wow. Many scholars argue that the original name was Baal. And they emend it to that. They change the name in the manuscript. Okay. Why? Because they say. Well, it can't be the same as the later guy you're going to be called Beowulf, because that would just be too confusing. That's the only reason. There's no other reason to amend it to this B-E-O-W, because the manuscript very, very clearly reads. I'm trying to see if I can find it if it's on this page. If it is, it's under this great big smudge right here. Um, so, Shield has a son named Beowulf, and we're told his name was famous, etc. And then we get a gnomic passage. Thus should a young man bring about good with pious gifts from his father's possessions, so that later in life, loyal comrades will stand beside him when war comes. The people will support him. With praiseworthy deeds, a man will prosper among many people. 
Now I've had an idea for a book about Beowulf kicking around in my brain, but I've not done anything with it. And the idea first came to me when I was a graduate student working on Beowulf, working on, on my PhD. <coughs> Professor at the time said, you really need to write that and get it published because it would be groundbreaking because it's so provocative. In other words, I'm going to really piss a lot of people off with this idea. Okay? And part of it relates to this passage. Thus should a young man bring about good with pious gifts from his father's possessions. What does that mean? Notice it's with his father's possession, not his own. What's he doing with his father's possessions? He's sharing them with the people. He's sharing them. So that later in life, loyal comrades will stand beside him when war comes. So why does a young man share out his father's goodies to those around him. So that when he's old, they'll stick with him. Now, how many of you read this poem before? All the way through? Or a version of it? Some, most of you. What happens at the end? Sorry, I'm going to give away the ending for the rest of you. Beowulf dies. Beowulf dies. Well, that's not really giving away the end. Because <laughs> that happens to everybody, right? <laughs> Tolkien actually says in his Beowulf, in his essay on Beowulf, that is the central theme of all Anglo-Saxon literature. The death of man and all his works. Think about that for a moment. The death of man, humanity, and all their works. Everything we do, everything we make, everything we write, everything we build, ultimately will Rot. There's a cheery idea. Okay. There in the wanderer, right? It's there in the seafarer. Okay. Everything here is what's their favorite word? Lana. Transitory. Nothing lasts. Okay. So, what's going to happen to Beowulf when he's an old man? The dragon comes and torches his kingdom. He goes off to fight. How many of his men fight with him? And yet he's got a whole bunch of guys. He's given all the best armament to, all the best weapons. And they go all Monty Python and run and hide. <laughs> the people will support him. With praiseworthy, praiseworthy deeds, a man will prosper among any people. So we go back to Shield. Shield passed away at, notice, his appointed hour. What's his appointed hour? The Old English, if I remember right, has to do with that word, um, Fida, but that's not what it is. Okay, I was mistaken. So Shield dies at his appointed time. That notion of appointed time, not quite Germanic. I mean, it's kind of Germanic, but there's a mixture of something else, which we'll talk about a little bit later. He did what? He went into the Lord's keeping. Well, that sounds nice. They bore him down to the brimming sea, and what did they do? Put him in a boat, pile a bunch of treasure around him, and cast him out to sea. And then maybe what do they do according to almost every movie that has something to do with a Viking death? Some, you know, Olympic champion archer stands, you know, on a high mountain, and that boat, you know, is the size of a postage stamp, 400 yards away, and he goes, you know, and lets loose the arrow, just one arrow. Hits the boat and burns and it sinks. Well, if it burned and it sank, how would we know they ever did these kind of, of burials? We wouldn't, right? Because they didn't do that. <laughs> they didn't. They did put people in boats and sink the boats because some of those boats have been discovered. Okay? Or they took boats, they put people in them, and then they buried them. 1938, east of England, a place called Suttonhoo, 
Lady owns a whole bunch of land, and on the land are a bunch of mounds. Okay? She figured they're probably burial mounds. <clears throat> but she decides she's going to have one of the mounds excavated. Her name is Elizabeth, no, not Elizabeth, Edith. It's either Pretty or Petty. Three hours of sleep is just not good for my brain. It's one of those two. And it's 1938, so it's a year before World War II breaks out. All right? So she hires a local archaeologist, Basil something or other. I mean, they're all Basil something or other. Basil or Neville, you know. Uh, <laughs> and he digs into the largest of the mounds and discovers... A ship burial. Okay. When I say the largest of the mound, I'm talking about a mound that's about 100 feet in diameter and about 30 or 40 feet tall. Okay. Digs down in, realizes this mound has been dug into before grave robbers. Okay. But he excavates it, and you can look at pictures online and stuff, and he sees in the sand the outline of the planks okay, and the rivets. And he even thinks there might have been at one point a body in the sand. Okay? But he also discovers, okay, he also discovers uh, treasure. <laughs> what do I mean by treasure? Well, an old rusty mail coat, so it's a pile of rust. But it's still kind of treasure. Part of a sword, the hilt, or blades, more or less rusted away. Gold coins, now that's treasure. Gold purse lid, that's treasure. Okay. Gold belt buckle, about this big, shaped more oblong, you know, rounded ends, weighs, um, I don't remember how much weighs, pound or so. Solid gold. It's not plated. It's solid gold. Yeah, I think there is a picture in your book. Back in the introduction. Yeah, there it is. On um, page 47. Okay. The little, you know, where you see little black dots. The little black dots are little teeny tiny inlaid stones. And this is produced in the so-called Dark Ages. We don't have jewelers today that can reproduce this quality. <laughs> Similarly, we don't have illuminators who can do this. And this is from the Lindisfarne Gospels. So, they discover, they discover all this stuff. And because they think there might once have been a body here, they have to determine who does it belong to. Because in British law, if you find treasure buried in the ground, they have to have a coroner's inquest to determine why is it in the ground. Because the purpose for which it was put in the ground determines <coughs> who owns it, whether it belongs to the person who owns the land that it's buried in, or the crown. See, if it's, if it's what's called grave goods, if it was put in the ground to stay there for all eternity, it belongs to the person upon whose land it is found. If it's treasure, if it was put into the ground so that it could later be dug up again, it belongs to the crown. Same law still applies. All right? So if you're, you know, vacationing for a month in England and you go off with your trusty, handy dandy metal detector and you start walking over somebody's property and it goes, bip, 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 and you start digging and you pull a bunch of gold up out of the ground, one, it's not yours. <laughs> Two, it's not necessarily the person who owns the land. Because there will be a coroner's inquest to determine, is it treasure or is it grave goods? Yes? If it were found in a burial mound, wouldn't it be almost meant to be there forever? Though? Not necessarily. Because 
No body was discovered. Human remains. The, no actual human remains because the, the soil is extremely sandy. Right? So there's, it was thought, and you know, we've got photography of it, but it's 1938 photography. It's not like today with, you know, what we're able to do with lighting and, and etc. It was thought there was a slight shade to the soil, and there might have been a little bit of phosphorus, which could have indicated human you know, remains and such, but nothing conclusive. So they have the coroner's inquest, and a piece of evidence entered into the court was this passage from Beowulf to describe a boat burial, because the burial here pretty much describes everything that was at the Sutton Hoo burial. You have a standard, okay, like a, a pennant, okay. You have weapons, you have armor, you have coins, okay. And the thing is, the stuff that was buried here isn't just quote unquote pagan Germanic stuff. You have about a three foot wide dish, silver plate not silver plated, a plate made of solid silver from Alexandria, Egypt. It's way the hell up in England, you know. <laughs> Nowhere near Alexandria, Egypt. You have a bowl from Constantinople. So Alexandria, Constantinople, two centers of Christendom, even though Alexandria by that time was run by uh, Arabs and such. Okay, what else? <coughs> There's two spoons. One of them has inscribed in it in Latin letters. Salos. And the other one has inscribed in it. Paulos. Which almost everybody took to be baptismal spoons. Because Saul became Paul. So, was this a Christian burial? Well, if it was, what's this Christian having all this stuff buried with him for when he doesn't need that to, you know, go meet Jesus, etc.? Well, it's thought now, not proven, but it's thought, that the person who was buried here is a king of East Anglia named Radwald, whom Bede mentions. Radwald became a Christian. This is about 625. Okay, so we're pretty close to after when Augustine comes. Radwald became a Christian and then became an apostate. He took it back. He didn't quite take it back. He said, you know, I'm no longer sure. So he raised a Christian altar and building next door, he raised an altar to the pagan gods. He's kind of like, you know, if Jesus isn't real, I've still got Thor. And if Thor isn't real, I've still got Jesus. <laughs> Not figuring that if either of them are real, they're going to be pissed, you know, <laughs> the way he does this. Okay? Coroner determines it's a burial. It all belongs to Mrs. Pretty. Okay? Everything. And there's a face mask, okay, remains of a face mask. It's just a ton of stuff. I mean, they've got an actual part of the medieval room at the British Museum is just for Sutton Hoo. Because, right? I mean, it's just mind-blowing. Okay? She immediately said, no, no, it's not mine. <laughs> and she gave it to the ground. All of it. Okay? That was one mound. There's like 30 mounds on her property. I still don't think they've all been excavated. I could be wrong about that. I know they did quite a few of them in the 60s through the, through the 80s. And you can check out big old massive books in the library, you know, like this thick about the findings from Sutton Hoo and such. You can go to Sutton Hoo today. You, they've got a nice little walk. You can go, you can walk around the mounds, not on the mounds, but, and then go inside the museum kind of thing, which is built in the shape of an upturned ship to give you an idea of how big the ship is. The ship was like 110 feet long, so I think 40 feet wide. Okay. Here's the kicker. Nearest source of water, two miles away, downhill. 
So they had to sail the ship up the River Deben and then pull it slash push it over logs, rollers, uphill to get it to this place. And then they didn't dig a hole. They just left it in a pile of dirt on top of it. How would they have done that? Just with shovels. Okay? This is a lot of man hours. This is indicating whoever was buried here or memorialized here was really important for some reason. Okay? So we get all the description of the stuff that's in the ship. And we're told at the end of that passage, this is what's considered the prologue to Beowulf, beginning with line 50. So they set the golden ensign over him, and they sent him out to the waves, and we're told, men do not know how to say truly, or, yeah, how to say truly, not trusted counselors, nor heroes under the heavens, who received that cargo? We don't know where it went to. It's kind of like, what? Well, it's the exact same way he came. Shield arrived in a boat, and he left in a boat. Sound, other than the leaving in a boat, sound like anybody else? Moses. Mo, you know, little bull rush boat. His mother leaves him in. He's a foundling. Very similar beginnings. Okay? So we're told, then Beowulf, the son of Shield, Beowulf Shielding, beloved king, was famous in the strongholds for a long time. His father passed away until after him, that is Beowulf, after Beowulf, rose the great Halfdane. Halfdane is a historical character. Problem is there are several guys named Halfdane. Doesn't mean, you know, Halfdane, half Norwegian. It's not that kind of half, okay? Who held the glorious shieldings all his life. The shieldings are called... In Norse and Danish, the skjöldungs. Okay, so if you ever read anything, um, you know any Norse sagas, anything you'll hear about or read about the skjöldung. This is a real dynasty. We actually we know historical stuff about them. Those are. The shieldings, or as they get often written in modern English, the shieldings. Okay? Shield just means shield or protector, if you want. So, Half Dane is born later on. He's not Beowulf's son. And what happened? Well, he held the glorious shieldings all his life, ancient and fierce, and he has four children. So. We get half Dane, and I'm going to spell his name D A N E, and he gets four children. Four. Herogar, Hrothgar, Halga the Good, and who? Herogar, I'm going to spell Hrothgar with the T H. Hrothgar, Halga. And this is a daughter. G A U G. And she's not named. Okay? Later on, we're going to meet Beowulf, and Beowulf has his parents. His mother isn't named. Okay? His mother is the fourth child of Hrethel the Gate, and we get Beowulf's mother, Helak. Make sure I get these in order. Uh, hold those are right I'll turn it up later. So, three sons and a daughter, and then among the Geats, three sons and a daughter, and then among the Swedes, it's a little bit different, which we'll talk about them later. So, Herogar, Hrothgar, Holiger the Good, and then we're told. And I heard that, and then there's a blank in the manuscript. There's literally a blank spot. Heard that 
I don't remember her name. I'll come back and fill it in later. <laughs> Somebody was on a list queen. Dear bedfellow of the battle shore. This Onola is going to be the same Onola we're going to meet later on in the poem. Okay? We know from other sources that person's name is Irsa, sometimes spelled Y-R-Y-R-S-A. And it's from that name that we get modern kind of English. Okay. Then success in war was given to Hrothgar. Wait, okay, we know he died. Why Hrothgar? Why not Herodot? Germanic custom is the kingship is passed on to the eldest son. My son, who is not my eldest child, my eldest son, who is not my eldest child, likes to call himself the heir. My other children all call him the heir head. <laughs> so success in war was given to Hrothgar, honor of battle, so that his beloved kinsmen served him. Young soldiers grew into a mighty troop of men. He thought, I'm going to build a big old hall. It'll be the greatest hall the world has ever seen. Okay. And we're told, line 71, and there within he would share everything with young and old that God had given him, telling us, He's going to be a good Germanic king in terms of gift giving. Okay? He's going to share everything. What? Except for the common land, that is, except for the land held by the people in common, and the lives of men. He doesn't deal in slaves. Not African slaves. You know, his enemies. He goes and conquers a nation. He doesn't take their people as slaves. He probably kills them, frankly. I don't know which would be kinder, but we can debate that. So, we're told, the hall gets proclaimed. People do what? They, they give him money to help build this hall. Why? Because he's kind of like his great, 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 great ancestor. If they didn't give him money, what would Hrothgar do? Yeah, terrorize them. Okay. He names it Herat. And your gloss tells you, heart. An object recovered from the burial mound at Sutton Hoo, perhaps a royal insignia, is surmounted by the image of a heart. The object he's talking about looks like this. Looks like a whetstone. It has a little thing on the bottom, like a hollow, like a cup. And on the top, it has a ring. And on top of the ring is the image of a stag. Okay, This has been taken to be a royal scepter that would sit on the kneecap. And that's the little hollow thing would sit right there. It's also taken to be a whetstone that you'd use to sharpen a sword or a knife. Okay? We're told, line 80, he remembered his boast. He gave out rings, treasure at table, the tall Howard, high and horn gabled. They haven't even had the ribbon cutting ceremony. It awaited hostile fires, the surges of war. Okay. It awaited hostile fires. I don't remember. Yeah, the word therefore awaited is our old friend Bod, which is a slightly different form of the Yabedith. This is just be done, okay? Doesn't have the uh, prefix to it. But it's the same thing. Awaited, experienced, expected. So it awaited hostile fires, the surges of war. Time was not yet at hand when the sort hate of sworn in-laws should arise after ruthless violence. Look at your footnote. The Hall Herat is apparently fated to be destroyed in a battle between Hrothgar and his son-in-law Ingeld Hedebar, a conflict predicted by Beowulf in 2024-69. The battle itself happens outside 
the action of the poem. Okay? Now look where the poet tells us this information. The hall has been built. It's ready to be lived in. And the poet says, by the way, it's all going to burn to the ground. Why is it going to burn to the ground, however? Because of the sword hate of sworn in-laws. Okay? What are in-laws? Parents of the person you marry. Okay? Parents of the person you marry or? Siblings. Siblings? Family. I know some people don't like to consider in-laws family, you know. My wife's family, you have in-laws and outlaws. Okay? Family. And I'll notice this. The hall gets built, and we're going to be told family warfare is going to result in its destruction. A bold demon who waited in darkness wretchedly suffered all the while. For every day he heard the joyful din loud in the hall with the harp sound, the clear song of the show. So they move in right after the poet says, oh, by the way, it's all going to burn to the ground. And meanwhile, we're told, meanwhile, out at the fringes of society or outside the scope of Hrothgar and his hall, what? There is a demon waiting in darkness who hears the joyful din and wretchedly suffers. He hears the sound of the shop singing. He hears the laughter and the revelry. He who knew how to tell the ancient tale of the origin of men said that the Almighty created the earth. Bright and shining plain, seas embraced, and set triumphantly the sun and moon to light their beams. What? What's this passage talking about? He who knew how to... This is the song of the show. This is what Grendel can hear off in the distance. For all intents and purposes, this is Cadman singing his hymn. Okay? It's a song about creation. And we're told, line 99, Thus this lordly people lived in joy, blessedly, till one began to work his foul crimes, a fiend from hell. Now, a fiend from hell implies what? A demon. A demon. So what kind of being is Grindel? If he's a demon, he's, where is he on the, the realm, you know, the great chain of being kind of thing? Is he? more powerful than angels. Yeah, he's up there with the angels. A demon's what? Fallen angel. Doesn't mean he loses his it loses its angelic nature. It just becomes twisted. Okay? But hold that thought. Because we've been told he's a demon. We've been told a fiend from hell. We are told, line 102, this grim spirit was called Grindel. We're not exactly sure what Grindel means. Some scholars suggest it comes from the old English verb. Grindon, which means to grind, which is how he eats people. Okay. He was a mighty stalker of the marches. What are the marches? I mean, the old English word, he is a march stepper. March stepper. Stepper. So he steps in the marches. You got to use a different word for marches. You got to use the modern English word, marshes. Okay? But what does it really mean? It's the borders. This is a border dweller. Okay? Really appropriate for, you know, modern, you know, build a wall, guys, and Grindel won't be able to come in. Well, they kind of do. It's called Herod. <laughs> He held the moors and, and fins. Now what is he described as? This miserable man. One Sally Ware. Okay. One Sally Ware. This full of woes man. 
Okay, so is he a fallen angel or is he a man? Can't be both. Physically, two totally separate different things, okay? This miserable man lived for a time in the land of giants after the creator had condemned him among Cain's race. Now, there's something we can sink our teeth into. There's something we can get a, a hard grip on. Cain, all right, Cain. When he, Cain, killed Abel, the eternal Lord avenged that death. So notice what, you know, God is a good Anglo-Saxon, you know, getting revenge. Remember the last week I had the fourfold ethic? Duty one's lord, duty to one's kin, duty to avenge one's lord and kin. God's following that, right? No joy in that feud, that is Cain. Cain didn't get any joy. How do you get joy in a feud? You win. You kill your enemy. That's how you get joy in your feud. I talked to someone, I was doing reference checks for our chair candidates in the other day, and I actually spoke to one of the real Hatfields. West Virginia, Hatfield McCoys, you know that old feud? I spoke to one. She's like, yeah, my name's Hatfield. And she goes, yes, those Hatfield. And I was like, oh, okay. That idea is there. So no joy in that feud. The maker forced him, Cain, far from mankind for his foul crime. From thence, from Cain, arose all misbegotten things, trolls and elves and the living dead, Zombies. <laughs> and also the giants who strove against God for a long while. He gave them their reward. Notice, Cain, excuse me, Grendel is a descendant of Cain. Cain's human. Okay. That means Grendel is human, at least of sorts, because what else, obviously, we were just told to say from Cain? Trolls and elves and giants. And most people would say, not human. Okay, uh, it's 11.05. We will stop there. So we'll pick up with line 115. We actually got farther than I expected. <laughs>